السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من أول يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صلى محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من يطع الله والرسول فأولئك الذين أنعم الله عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls and the enlightenment of the hearts and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior Allah Ta'ala Farajul Sharif enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Respected elders, brothers and sisters Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh Wa Alaikum Salaam he is one of the most well-known and revered companions of the grandson of the Holy Prophet, Sayyid al-Shuhada, a man who despite being at the age of 75 on the 10th of Muharram, fought valiantly and displayed excellence in courage and determination. An individual who is truly schooled under the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt Specifically, Amir al muminin Imam al Hassan al Mujtaba, as well as Sayyid al Shuhada, peace and blessings be upon them. <coughs> Habib ibn Mudahir al Asadi is today considered to be one of the most outstanding graduates from the University of Karbala. An individual whose life indeed is an exemplary one for many to follow and to seek lessons to apply in their lives and in general community around the world. Habib ibn Mudahir's personality, biography, and life deserves a thorough look. Why? Because he is unique for a number of reasons. The first is that he is arguably one of the closest companions of Imam Sayyid al-Shuhada Abu Abdullah al-Husayn sallallahu wa sallam Having been praised by the Imam on numerous occasions. Likewise, Imam al-Husayn gave him the leadership 
of the left side of the army. At the same time, what do we find? We find Habib ibn Mubahir, Allah ta'ala alayhi, was the one who received a special form of knowledge from Amir al-Mu'mineen, known as Ilm al-Balaya wal Manaya, the knowledge of calamities and what happens at the time of death. At the same time, you recognize the status of Habib ibn Mubahir in which way? When you come to Karbala, to the shrine of Aba Abdullah, and you note that the only companion who has a grave by himself is Habib ibn Mubahir. An individual, who, where do we find? We find the 12th Imam praising him and sending salutations upon him in Ziyaratul Nahiyatul Muqaddasa, in which the Holy Imam would say, Assalamu ala Habib ibn Mubahir al-Asadi. Therefore, Habib ibn Mubahir's life is something which is exceptional because he is referred to as Shaykh al Ansar, the head of the helpers. When you come to look at the Arabic language, the word Ansar is not the same as Ashab. There is a clear difference. What's the difference between an Ansari and a Sahabi? Arab linguists, they come forward and say a Sahabi is someone who accompanies an individual, is with another individual, associates themselves with that particular individual. Yet an Ansari, someone who is from the Ansar, is someone who supports and stands to do whatever it takes to align themselves with that particular individual whom they are supporting and assisting, which means that every Ansari is a companion, but not every companion is an Ansari. When we look at the Holy Quran, this is a concept deeply rooted in the Holy Quran. Chapter 16, 61, verse 14. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you and I to take the path of Habib ibn Mubahir and to become Ansarullah. Because the Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, kunu ansar Allah. O oh, you who believe, be those who stand to support Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kama qala Isa ibn Maryam lil hawariyeen, man ansari ila Allah. Isa ibn Maryam turned towards the hawariyoon and said, Who amongst you are the ones who can be considered ansar Allah? That's why when you and I recite the ziyarah of the companions of, of the Imam alayhi salam, ziyarah to shuhada in Karbala, what do we recite? We recite, Assalamu alaykum ya ansara deen Allah. Assalamu alaykum ya ansara rasool Allah. Assalamu alaykum ya ansara amir al-mu'mineen. Assalamu alaykum ya ansara fatimah al-zahra sayyidati nisa al-alameen. Assalamu alaykum ya ansara abi muhammad al-hasan ibn ali al-wali al-nasih. Assalamu alaykum ya ansara abi abdillah. Isn't it? The word Ansar is repeated several times in the ziyara that you and I recite to pay our respects for these holy individuals because the whole idea is to stand in support and to do whatever we can to raise the aspects and whatever these holy individuals sought to establish and to guide and to deliver to mankind. And that is why the goal for you and I, when we seek to look at the life of Habib ibn Mubahir, is to learn how to become Ansarullah by following on the footsteps of Shaykh al-Ansar. Right Shaykh al-Ansar is whom? Is this great individual, Habib ibn Mubahir al-Asadi. Therefore, I would like to look at the life of Habib ibn Mubahir in detail analyzing many aspects of his illustrious personality and stopping at several stations to connect with the contemporary world and for us to learn as many lessons as we possibly can so that we can follow on his footsteps 
and are able to fulfill the Quranic injunction and command from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala to be referred to as Ansarullah because nobody can be the manifestations of Ansarullah just like how the companions and the Ansar of Aba Abdullah al Hussein demonstrated on the 10th of Muhammad. Why? Because Abu Abdullah says, I do not know of any better companions than you. You are the best, the creme de la creme, the, the, the most brilliant examples of individuals who stood to support the mission and the delivery as well as the objective of the Imam alayhi salam. When we look at this man, Habib ibn Mubahar, the first thing that we have to discuss is the name of his father. Controversially, sometimes people have misspelled or mispronounced the name of the father of Habib. In which way? We are told in historical records that some scholars like Ibn Kathir refers to Habib's father as Mutahhar. Yes? We find others like Ibn Damashqi says, no, it is Mudahhar. Yet, 19 historians, Shia and Sunni scholars like Sheikh al Mufid, Sheikh al Tusi, Sheikh al Tabrasi, people like Tabari and others have come forward and said the father of Habib, his name is Mubahir. The meme has a dhamma on it and the dad has a kasra underneath it. I did not find any evidence or historical sources that suggests that the name of the father of Habib is Mazahir. There is no evidence for that, yes? It is Mubahir. The correct pronunciation of his name is Habib ibn Mubahir, according to the majority of our scholars and historians. Habib, when was he born? We are told he was born in an area in modern-day Saudi or in Arabia known as Badi Najd. He was born in which date? We don't know the date, yet we can deduce it. How do we deduce it? On the 10th of Muharram, Habib ibn Mubahir was 75 years of age. Therefore, through deduction, we come to the conclusion that he was born 14 years before the Hijrah and one year before the Bi'tha of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Of course, Habib is from the tribe of Bani Asad, this tribe that is fairly well known in Arabia and indeed a tribe that took part in many expeditions and battles before Islam that it derives its name from a man by the name of Asad ibn Khuzayma. Bani Asad stand for a number of noble traits. We are told that Bani Asad first, or a number of them, embraced the religion of Islam in the year 9 after Hijrah, when a delegation came to meet the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny, and they embraced the religion of Islam. Yet an examination of historical records reveals the merit of Bani Asad in many ways. Number one, the river of al qani in Karbala was dug and established by an individual who is from Bani Asad. His name is al qama Al-Asadi. Number two, Bani Asad helped the holy fourth Imam in the burial of Shuhada in Karbala. Number three, Imam Hussein alayhi salam bought Karbala and the area from Bani Asad. Number four, you find two of the rep special representatives of Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farad al Sharif. By the name of Uthman ibn Sa'id al Umari, he's from Bani Asad. Muhammad ibn Uthman, his son, is from Bani Asad. And there are a number of martyrs on the 10th of Muharram who were from what? From Bani Asad. Habib had married once in his life to a noble lady by the name of Um Qasim. She was known for her valor, for her commitment, for her encouragement of her husband to stand with the path of the Ahlul Bayt. Narrations tell us of her noble characteristics. 
For as an example, we are told that one day in Kufa, she said to her husband, Habib, she said, Oh, my husband, in my dream, I saw Sayyidatul Nisa Fatima come and tell me, Why don't you inform your husband, Habib, to color his beard? Habib at that moment said, I will do so. I will obey the daughter of Rasulullah. He left the house to go towards the marketplace in Kufa looking to buy color in order to color his beard. At that moment, he met Muslim ibn Awsaja, who is also from Bani Asad. When he met Muslim, he said to him, I see that you are wearing armor in order to go and fight. What has happened? He said, replied back by saying that Muslim ibn Aqil had been executed and attained martyrdom. And I am going to what? To stand and fight with Aba Abdullah and Hussein. At that moment, Habib recognized what the Lady of Light wanted. He threw the color and said, what the Lady wants is for my beard to be drenched with my blood. And that's why what? He came back and what informed his wife. We are told he had three sons, Qasim, Muhammad, and Abdullah. Qasim was the one who saw the head of his father on a spear and wanted to buy the head of his father in Kufa. Later on, he sought the killer of his father from Bani Tamim and found him alongside the army of Mus'ab ibn Umayr when Mus'ab was fighting Bani Umayyah. He entered the tent, he saw this man who had killed and beheaded his father Habib. He also beheaded him, carried his head, Mus'ab arrested him and executed him. Qasim ibn Habib ibn Mudahir. We are told Muhammad, the other son of Habib, attained shahada and martyrdom on the 10th of Muharram with his father in Karbala. When you analyze this particular individual, you recognize what? You recognize the question that people ask. Was he a Sahabi of the Prophet or not? Because today historians come forward and ask the question, did Habib ibn Mudahir ever meet Rasulullah or not? In my humble research, there are two schools of opinion, and please focus on this, because perhaps you may not have come across this realization about Habib before. One school of thought says, Habib ibn Mudahir was a companion of the Holy Prophet. He met the Holy Prophet. He heard from the Holy Prophet. And they cite a narration which is found in the book Ma'al al-Sabtain by Shaykh al haili What is this narration? This narration says that one day the Holy Prophet was walking and he saw children playing. At that moment he saw a man or one of the children take the soil from underneath whom his grandson Aba Abdullah and kiss it and place it on his head. He came, he hugged this particular child. People said, why are you hugging this child? He said, because Jibra'il told me that what? That this young man will stand to fight with my grandson Hussein on the 10th of Muharram and support him. Yet there are a number of problems with this narration. Let's be objective, academically look at this narration. The first is what? It is Mursala. Mursala means what? We do not know who narrated this. That the actual narrator is missing. So the chain is broken, number one. Number two, what was the age of Habib when Imam السلام, was young? Sayyid al-Shuhada. Because we said Habib ibn Mudahir was born 14 years before Hijrah. Imam al Hussein was born either three years or four years after Hijrah. And if he was playing, he must have been at least three years of age. So at that particular time, Habib's age must have been 20. Because if you add 14, yes, plus 3 when Imam was born, plus 3 if Imam was 3 years of age when the children were pl playing, that makes the age of Habib 20. It is difficult to see how Habib as a 20-year-old will play with the children. That's a bit difficult. Likewise, what do we find? We find not many, we don't find any records from historians and scholars who come forward and say that Mubahir, as well as Habib, his son, were in Medina. We do not have records, except a possibility that amongst Bani Asad, when they came to meet the Prophet in the year 9 after Hijrah, and declare their Islam, it is likely that Habib was there with them. He came, and that he embraced Islam, and he declared his support for the Holy Prophet. One school of thought has that particular opinion, 
The other says no. There is no doubt that if there is ambiguity whether Habib was a Sahabi of the Prophet or not, there is no doubt about his special status in relation to the commander of the faithful, Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu In that, no one can argue that Habib ibn Mubahir was one of the special ashab of the commander of the faithful. He fought with him in Jamal, in Sufin, in Nahrawan. Narrations tells us, after each battle, Habib would be disappointed. Imam would say to him, why do I see you disappointed? He would say, Ya Amir al muminin I wanted shahada, I wanted martyrdom. Imam would say to him, you will definitely attain martyrdom, yet fighting alongside my son, al Hussein on the 10th in the battle of Karbala. At the same time, Habib ibn Mubahir was known as one of the Shurtatul Khamis. Who are Shurtatul Khamis? Shurtatul Khamis refers to a special unit that Imam السلام, established in order to protect him and to protect the Muslims. These were individuals who swore to defend Amir al muminin even if it means that they give their lives. These were people like Abu Dhar, Miqdad, Salman, Rashid, people who would commit themselves to the path of the commander of the faithful. Along with them, was Habib ibn Mubahir. They had recognized the status of the commander of the faithful. They had understood who Amir al muminin was and indeed what they have to do to stand alongside him. Because I recall listening to one of our maraja who is alive today, Ayatollah al Umma Sheikh Wahid al Khurasani, Hafidahullah. He narrates this. He says, on the day of judgment in Jannah, the people of Jannah, whilst they're enjoying the bounties and the beauties of paradise, all of a sudden see light emerging just as the sun is rising. They see something that looks like the sun. The light that is coming is very, very strong. They are questioning because the Quran says, لا يرون فيها شمسا ولا زمهريرا. There is no moon or sun in Jannah. So they ask, they say, what is this? We are told there is no sun in paradise. The malaika will say, this is not the sun. This is the light that comes out from the mouth of Ali ibn Abi Talib when he smiles in Jannah. <laughs> yes, they were individuals who recognized this particular maqam. In which way? We are told that the same marja speaks about the fact that the prophets of God are all manifestations of his light. They are all Anwar. He goes on to say, however, Nur al-Anwar is Ali ibn Abi Talib. The light of the light, the light in which light itself seeks in order to be illuminated is Amir al muminin Some people have a question about that. They say, how is it possible that you put the position of Amir al muminin above that of the prophets, except the Holy Prophet, of course. How is that possible? Because I recall a lady who was a devout individual who followed the path of Amir al muminin at the time of the wretched tyrant, Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. She would walk around and say and speak about the merits of Amir al muminin At that moment, they told Hajjaj, this particular lady is saying such and such. He summoned her. He says to her, is it true that you're saying Ali ibn Abi Talib is better than the other companions, including the first three Khulafa? She said, no, I didn't say that. He said, what did you say? She said, I said that Ali ibn Abi Talib is better than all human beings except Rasulullah. More than that. He said, how dare you give me evidence, otherwise I will behead you. She said, I give you evidence. When we speak about the prophets, she goes on to say, Adam alayhi salam was told, don't eat from the tree. Adam ate from the tree, in which we believe was not a sin, yet tarke awla, doing that which was not desirable, not following that which should have been followed, but is not a necessarily disobedience of God. 
she would then say that Ali ibn Abi Talib would say, by God, if I'm given the seven heavens in order to take an ounce or a grain of barley from the back of an ant, I will never do so because it's the disobedience of God the Almighty. Compare this with Adam. Then she would come forward and say, Ibrahim, what did he say? Ibrahim said to Allah, Arini kayfa tuhyil mawta. Oh Allah, show me how you bring back life to the dead. Allah says, Awalam tu'min, do you not believe? Uh, Ibrahim says, Bala, walakin li yatma'inna qalbi. Yes, but I want my heart to attain itma'inan. I want certainty. I want yaqeen for my heart. She responds to Hajjaj and says, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, Law kushifa anni al ghita mastad to yaqeen. If the veils are removed, my yaqeen would still be strong in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, she says, Musa, Musa and Harun said to the Almighty, Rabbana innana nakhaf. Oh Allah, we are afraid when it comes to going to Fir'aun. Why? Lest Fir'aun kill us and not allow us to deliver the message. Amir al-Mu'mineen would sleep on the bed of the Holy Prophet on the night of the Hijrah when he would say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, as long as you will be protected and your life will be saved, I am obedient and I will do whatever you say. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Malaika, who amongst you would sacrifice their lives for the other? None of them will. He then would say, look at my servant Ali. He's prepared to sacrifice his life for my servant Muhammad. Go and protect him. They would come down, Jibra'il, Mika'il, Israfil, next to the head of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and would say to him, Man mithlaka ya Ali, wa bika allihubahi allahu malaikat as-sama, who is like you, O Ali, and Allah is showing you off to the angels of the heaven. Yes, and at the same time, what do we find? We find she says, Isa alayhi salam. Isa's mother was pregnant. She was in a house of God, Baytul Maqdis. She was worshipping God. She's about to go into labor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to her, now you leave my house and you go under a palm tree and you deliver Isa there. Whereas you look at Amir al-Mu'mineen, Fatiba bint Asad was told, go inside the Kaaba and give birth to Allah. Isn't it? That's why we are told that what? That this particular individual, Habib ibn Mudahir, associated himself with Amir al-Mu'mineen. And Amir al-Mu'mineen taught him this knowledge. What is this knowledge? This knowledge that the Imma would specifically choose certain individuals and teach them about aspects which other human beings will not know. The science or the ulum of calamities and what would happen at the time of death for themselves and others. That's why the famous narration says in Kufa, in a gathering of Bani Asad, we find who Maytham and Tamar, as well as Habib ibn Mudahir having a conversation. What conversation do they have? Maytham looks at Habib and says that I can see, uh, or Habib looks at Maytham and says, I can see a man who is bold and who has a belly, who stands to support the family of the Holy Prophet, selling melons at Darul Rizq, he would be, what? He would be crucified and killed for the sake of God. Maytham would look at Habib and say, I see a man who has a red complexion, leaves the city of Kufa to defend the grandson of the Holy Prophet, is killed, and his head is carried on a spear inside Kufa. They both leave this majlis. The people who are listening, they said, both of these people are liars. What are they talking about? After a while, Rashid al-Hajari, another man who was taught this knowledge by Amir al-Mu'mineen, enters this particular gathering. They tell him, oh Rashid, shall we tell you what we heard from Habib, as well as Maytham al Tamar? He says, yes. They tell him. At that moment, he says, Rahimallah who made them. May Allah bless made them. He forgot one thing. And that is the man who carries the head of Habib will be given 100 dinars. They looked and said, he's like them. He's also crazy. He's lost his mind. They all later say, we saw exactly what these three individuals actually occur, happen. Indeed, this was what, how Amir al-Mu'mineen selectively chose those individuals who were so devout, so sincere, so committed to give them this knowledge. And that's why 
Habib ibn Mubahir would be a man who would continuously seek knowledge, wants to improve his understanding. He would ask Imam Sayyid al-Shuhada, Aba Abdullah al Hussein. he would say to him, Oh Imam, what were you before Adam was created? <coughs> Imam would say, Kunna Noor, we were light. Rahman. We were circumambulating around the throne of Allah. We used to teach the angels how to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Imam al Hussein would say to Habib, understand our maqam and our status. We are the ones who taught the malaika how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, what do we find? We find this emphasis upon knowledge is one that was established by Habib. He was a teacher, a narrator of hadith, who would sit in Masjid al Kufa and teach people the uloom of Ali Muhammad. The question arises now. If we are to be Ansarullah or Ansarul Hussein, if we are to take the example of Habib, what is our relationship when it comes to seeking knowledge? Let me be a bit more specific. As an example, how many of us have committed to, for instance, reading books, improving our understanding of our deen, not just leaving it to the majalis, not just isolating it to the madrasas or whatever we come across, we make a commitment to ensure that we have a program of study in order for our hearts to be illuminated. Because what? It needs that commitment. Tell me, why is it in the West that we don't have libraries, Shia, Muslim libraries open for all with so many books where it is busy, people coming in, studying, taking books out, that we should have these centers of learning and dissemination of the uloom. This is what people like Habib learned from the Ahl al-Bayt. That's what we need to inculcate and develop. Likewise, we find one recognition of the status of Habib when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam would write to him. He would say to him, this is a letter to Habib ibn Mubah, al-Faqih Habib ibn Mubahir, the knowledgeable one, Habib ibn Mubahir. Indeed, one emphatic praise by Sayyid al-Shuhada for Habib was what? Was when Imam al Hussein said to him, Lillahi darruka ya Habib. May Allah bless you, O Habib. You were a special man who used to complete the recitation of the Quran entirely in one night. <laughs> Habib ibn Mubahir was someone who had memorized the Holy Quran completely. The narrations tell us between Isha, after Isha prayers, until Fajr, he would recite the Quran. And Imam al Hussein's words are not ones to be taken lightly. Imam is praising Habib so that you and I would listen and ask the question what is our position when it comes to the Holy Quran? When it comes to this holy book in which we have been entrusted to protect, to look after, to learn, and to apply its lessons into our lives. We ask this question when the Quran says that it is a book. Kitabun and Zanna, we have revealed it to Khrijanas, Minak Vulumati ilan Nur. It's the book that takes people from darkness towards the light. Tell me, have we understood the status of the Holy Quran? Allah says, reflect on this verse. Law and Zanna had al Quran ala Jabalin, Lara Eitahu, Khashian, Mutasadian, Khashatilla. Allah says, if this Quran was revealed on a mountain, it would crumble and disintegrate due to the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What status has this particular holy words of the holy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala occupies to the extent that our fourth Imam, Imam Zayn al Abideen, would say that. That if the entire creation of God were what not to be present, I would never feel lonely because I have the Holy Quran. How many of us could say the same thing? That we have established this relationship with the Holy Quran. 
Yes, have we developed institutions, think tanks, organizations to advance the teachings of the Holy Quran, especially in the West? Have we made sure that we inculcate upon our youth and our children the importance of the Holy Quran and the need to number one memorize, number two recite in Arabic and learn the correct recitation in Arabic and number three seek the meaning and the interpretation and how it has relevance, continuous application in our lives. Let me give you a simple example. How many of us would travel and would utilize airlines, yes? In this particular country and other countries, when we are about to travel, we're told that as far as your baggage and your luggage is concerned, there is a weight limit, yes? Many would say that there is perhaps a 23 kilo limit on the luggage that you carry with you, that you take with you, uh, or you are able, sorry, to check in, yes? Even the ones that you take with you is also limited. Imagine yet you are packing your bags the night before, you know, those last minute dot com jobs, and you are packing your bags, and what do you find? That it's quite heavy. Why is it heavy? Because you have certain foods, certain chocolates or candies, that is pushing the weight limit over what is allowed. Yes? You have two choices. You either carry it and then you have to pay extra money, or you hope that they would allow it to pass through when you check in. Or well, the other option is to do what? Is to leave it. But some people would take a third option, and that is what? To eat it, yes? They say, I'll eat it now. Why should I take it with me? I'll eat it, yes? Now, why have I given this example? When you and I associate ourselves in the Quran, there are two or three ways that we associate. We are the ones who carry the Quran and place it on our shelves and kiss it and have respect for it. Or the ones who make sure that the Quran is recited and understood to the extent that it becomes part and parcel of us and it mixes with our flesh and with our existence. And then when we leave to the hereafter, it comes with us. Just like how the candy was part of us when we go on the plane. Yes, that when you and I are going on to Alam al Barzakh, we cannot take anything physical with us. Isn't it? But if the Quran is part of us, if the Quran is something that we have developed and inculcated within our existence, it will definitely come to our assistance and help in Alam al Barzakh and in Alam al Akhirah. That's why our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, would come forward and say, Our Shia, in Shia to Ali. كثير الصلاة كثير قراءة القرآن that the Shia of Ali one of their characteristics is that they seek to recite the Quran on a frequent basis they are not those who have abandoned the Quran that the Prophet will complain about on the day of judgment they recognize that they are in a better position to be Ashab al-Quran because they have the Ahl al-Bayt to interpret the Quran the way it should be interpreted and that's why they seek this and develop this relationship of the Quran, just like Habib ibn Mudahir radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi did. Likewise, another key characteristic and a feature and attribute of this great companion of Sayyid al-Shuhada is what? His focus upon salah. Because today he is known as the martyr of salah. Why? We are told in narrations and in the books of Maqatil that he attained his martyrdom in defense of the prayers that was established and recited by Imam السلام, and his companions. Yes, because the Quran tells us many instances that conversations take place between people on the Day of Judgment. One particular conversation is when it comes to those in Jannah. Those in Jannah will ask about those who they thought will be in Jannah, but they're not there. They ask, how are these people now being punished in Jahannam? Where are they? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then allows them to speak to them in hell. They see them being punished in hell. They see them getting the chastisement of the Almighty in Jahannam. Therefore, the people of Jannah will speak to the people, those individuals that they recognize. And the first thing they ask them is, how did you end up here? 
I, we thought that you would be in Jannah with us. Yes? Why are you being punished in Jahannam? Ma salaka kum fi saqar. Do you know what the response would be? It's not that we were not Muslims. It's not that, that we do not go, uh, go worship God. We were not those who cared and looked after prayers. Yes? Look at Aba Abdullah al Hussein. When you and I stand to honor this great individual, we recite what? Ziyarat Warif. What does it say in Ziyarat Warif? Ashhadu annaka aqamta salah. We bear witness that you established this important act of worship that is the first that you and I will be questioned upon on the day of judgment. If it's accepted, everything else is accepted. And if it's rejected, everything else will be indeed rejected. It is indeed Amud al-Din, the cornerstone and the foundation of our religion. We have to look after it. We have to emphasize upon it. We must not neglect it. Because the sixth Imam would say, لَنْ يَنَالُ شَفَاعَتُنَا مَنْ اسْتَخَفَّ بِصَلَاةِ those who take our prayers lightly will what? Will indeed not attain. Or those who will take their prayers lightly will not attain the shafa'ah. Isn't it? One example I gave of taking prayers lightly. This is a huge subject, but one note of reminder for our brothers. And that is what? The dress code when they come to perform their prayers. What do we mean? Often we speak about hijab and the need for modesty and chastity for our sisters. And the brothers, according to some of the youngsters, are chillaxing. You know, they are relaxed. They say, you know, it's nothing to do with me. They doze off thinking about, you know, I don't know, the latest basketball game or whatever. And then they come back when the recitation is about something else. Yet this is concerning the brothers because I have seen it in my own eyes in many different communities. And that is what? Some of our respected brothers, when they come to Salah, their dress code leaves a lot to be desired. In which way? They would wear, especially in the summer, shirts which are quite tight. Yes? Because it's part of the fashion. No problem. But they come to prayers. And when it's so tight, they go into sajda. And because it's so tight, it gets pulled up. And when it gets pulled up, God knows what is revealed. Yes? And poor the person who's praying behind them in congregation. Yes? They see all kinds of things without necessarily going into details. This is a problem jurisprudentially. Because the aura, the private parts, must be protected and concealed in salah. Yes? So when you and I are before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tell me, how many of us have been to interviews with jobs that we necessarily look to obtain? We wear the best of clothes. We go in our best of presentations. Yet when we come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we take it for granted and wear whatever we feel we want to wear. It is of the utmost importance that the Shia of Abu Abdullah, that the Shia of Ali are the ones who not only look after the Quran in the best way, but their salah is the salah of Ali and Hussein. That has to be the goal that we have to develop within our communities. Therefore, you find what? You find Habib ibn Mubahir had a number of exceptional qualities. One of them was that he was a man who was calm. Calm in which way? On the night of Ashura, we are told that he was seen smiling. Buray said to him, Oh, Kume, uh, oh Habib, you are smiling and tomorrow we're going to be slaughtered. How is that? He said, indeed, it is a matter to smile. Indeed, it's a time to what to look forward because it's only a few hours and we will be in Jannah. Yes, it will be a few hours. He was a man who would radiate this positivity in many places. That's why the Quran, when it praises certain individuals, Habib is one of them. In chapter 4, 69, verse 69, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whomsoever obeys Allah and the Messenger, فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءَ وَالْأَوْلَٰئِكَ مَعَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ they are with the prophets, with the truthful ones, with those, uh, those individuals who were witnesses and those who were righteous. And indeed, Habib ibn Mubahar was one of them. That's why one of the ulama would say that in my dream, one day I saw what? What did I see? I saw Habib ibn Mubahar. He said, I saw Habib ibn Mubahar. And I said to him, oh Habib, 
you have such a great status in the eyes of God. You are a man who served Amir al-Mu'mineen, who served Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba, who fought alongside Aba Abdullah al Hussein. You are the one who has his own dharih. People coming visiting Aba Abdullah will say salam to you first. And when they leave, they say salam to you again. You have such a position in the eyes of God. Did you want to do something in dunya that you did not do? Or would you like to come back to dunya to do something now? Habib would say to him, indeed, there is one thing I wish I can do. He says, what is it? He said, I wish I can return back to dunya and attend the majalis of Aba <laughs> Yes, and cry with those who cry for Imam al Hussein. Indeed, Habib ibn Mudahir here, in this particular example, is a true, loyal, exemplary, committed individual. Despite his age, he gave everything for the sake of Islam and in defense of the Ahl al-Bayt. What are we told? We are told that he is the one who initially wrote to Imam al Hussein to come to Kufa, isn't it? He said to him, he said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, we will oust uh, An Nu'man ibn Bashir from the governorship of Kufa and we will stand with you, we give you our allegiance. At that moment, we are told several of the other prominent individuals in Kufa also signed this letter. And the letters were sent to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein responded back to them and said to them that I will send my special ambassador, Muslim ibn Aqil, who will tell me about the situation of the people of Kufa. When the letter was received, we are told that Abis would get the letter, he would stand and say, Oh Aba Abdullah, I don't know about others, but as far as I'm concerned, I will fight and I will sacrifice and I will do absolutely everything that I have in order to uphold your principles. Habib would say, by Allah, I would also do the same. That's why he welcomed Muslim in Kufa. He would be the one who would look after Muslim ibn Aqil. He would be the one who would take the allegiance from the people for Imam al Hussein. Habib ibn Mubahir had such an important role in preparation of the city of Kufa for the eventual arrival of Imam Sayyid al-Shuhada, peace and blessings be upon him. And of course, what happened was after Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad had been positioned through the advice of Sir John to Yazid al-La'in, what happened was that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad imprisoned many people. He bought many people and individuals turned against Muslim ibn Aqil, the ambassador of Imam alayhi salam. Yet the question is, where was Habib? Because many of us know the story of Muslim where he looks around behind him in Masjid al-Kufa and there's no one to support him. The question that people have was, where, where was uh, Habib ibn Mubahir? Where was Muslim ibn Awsaja? Where were the others that joined Imam alayhi salam later? We are told that Bani Asad, when they saw that many had been disloyal to Muslim ibn Aqil, they barricaded and they prevented people like Habib ibn Mubahir and Muslim ibn Awsaja and others within the tribe of Bani Asad from leaving. In other words, they were forced and not allowed to continue to support Muslim ibn Aqil. That's why the narrations tell us that one day after the martyrdom of Muslim, Habib was consuming the food with his wife. When he was consuming the food, his wife said, I can foresee that someone will bring a letter from the grandson of the Holy Prophet. And indeed, after a few minutes, someone knocked on the door. Habib went, he bought this letter, he kissed it, he read it. The letter said to the knowledgeable Faqih, Habib ibn Mubahir, from Hussein ibn Ali, come and support us. You know my position in the eyes of God and my relationship with the Holy Prophet. Do not desert us because there is a special reward for you with my grandfather Rasulullah. What happened was Habib ibn Mubahir, when he read this particular letter, he prepared to leave towards this, the area and the land of Karbala. His wife would say to him, oh Habib, 
make sure that you make me proud on the day of judgment with Fatima to Zahra. Do not disappoint me, O oh Habib. And that's why we are told that he was in a difficult position because his tribe, some of the Bani Asad in Kufa, would not allow him to leave. And therefore, he decided to leave at night, just like how Muslim Ibn Hausajah left at night. What did he do? He left one of his servants, his slaves, and one of the gates of Kufa. And he said to him, you wait until I come at night and I will take my horse and I will go towards my master, Aba Abdullah. At night, he leaves discreetly, walking towards that area. And indeed, here's the conversation between the slave and the <laughs> horse. The slave would say to the horse, oh horse, if my master Habib would not come, I would ride upon you and I would go to serve my master Aba Abdullah and Hussein. Habib listens to this. One narration says he looks at Karbala. He says, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Even the slaves and the servants want to sacrifice their lives for you. He would say to him, go, you are free. You do not need to be here anymore. That servant looks at him and says, Habib, you want to go to Jannah and you don't want to take me with you? I beg you to take me with you. And indeed, Habib takes him and arrives in Karbala on the 6th of Muharram. We are told that Imam السلام, had divided his army into several segments. In other words, he gave the leadership of the right-hand side to Zuhair ibn al-Qayn and the main standard to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas as well as what? The flag for the left-hand side was not given to anyone. Many came to him and said, Ibn Rasulullah, we want the flag for the left-hand side. He would say, there is a man who is coming. I know he will come. I will give him this. This is for him. Habib ibn Mubahir arrives. He serves Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein is so eager and anxious to what anticipate and receive him. One of the many things that Habib ibn Mubahir achieved as soon as he arrived was that he went to Bani Asad. He said to Imam alayhi salam, he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Bani Asad are close by here in, Mac in, in Karbala. Let me go and speak to them. Maybe they will come and support us. Imam gives him the permission. He goes to Bani Asad. He says to them, جِئْتُكُمْ بِخَيْرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ I've come to you with the best of this world and the hereafter. They said, what is it? He said, answer the call of the grandson of Rasulullah. Stand to support him. So we told 70 horsemen, join Habib in order to go and be part of the army of Imam alayhi salam. Yet Umar bin Sa'ad and Laheen, what does he do? He stands before them. He would not allow them. And that's why the 70 would return. And Habib returns alone, informs Imam about this. And Imam alayhi salam would say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-ali al -azim. Habib ibn Mubahir, as a sheikh, as an elderly individual, by the age of 75, had a great role to play amongst the companions. Because can you imagine an individual at that age rallying everyone, trying to what? To increase the positivity and the passion that existed at that time. And indeed, he was a great role model for people to emulate and follow. As, for example, narrations tell us that on the night, on the 9th of Muharram, Shimr ibn al Joshan al Laeen comes forward and what? And wants to give immunity to whom? To a few individuals, including Abu al Fadl al Abbas. When Qamar bin Hashim rejects this categorically, we are told Umar ibn Sa'ad then calls and says, This is the time to attack the army and the caravan of Hussein ibn Ali. This moment, Imam commands Abu al Fadl Abbas. Habib ibn Mubahir, Zuhair ibn al qayn look at these individuals, what status they had, that the Imam would choose them and would say to them, and would say to a Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, Arkab binafsika ant, anta binafsi, go, you are just like myself. Yes, he would say to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, you are just like myself, go towards them and see what is it that they want. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, Habib ibn Mubahir, as well as Zuhair ibn al-Qayn would come. They would discuss. They would say, what is it that you want? They would say to them that we wish to fight. At that moment, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas returns. Beautifully, the narrations tells us, Habib ibn Mubahir and Zuhair ibn al-Qayn remained. 
remain at the front, having a discussion with individuals, they would say to them, Habib, would you utilize any opportunity to propagate the message, to invite them towards the right path, to make them understand the severity of their actions? He would say to them, do you know what crime you will commit and perpetrate by slaughtering the grandson of the Holy Prophet and his family, as well as those who spend the night in ibadah and remembrance of God? A man by the name of Uzzara says to him, Oh Habib, you are glorifying yourself. You are showing off. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn steps up and says, By God, he is not showing off. Allah has made the souls of those around Hussein remember every good deed. Yes, he would answer in this way. Imam would say to Abu al Abbas, ask them for one night, one more night, because we wish to recite Salah and as well as that recite the Holy Quran. Notice these two elements. Imam would say we wish to spend the night of Ashura in Ibadah and in remembrance of the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And what difficult night it was for whom? For the companions, for the Ansar. Why? Because they are anticipating the tenth. They are anticipating the sacrifice and the altruism. The narrations tell us that Nafi' bin Hilal, when he would return from what? From having this conversation with the master of the martyrs, he would stand outside the tent, yes? He would hear the conversation between Sayyidah Zainab and Aba Abdullah. <laughs> Sayyidah Zainab would say to Imam al Hussein, Have you tested your companions? Will they fight with you and sacrifice their life for you tomorrow? At that moment, Nafir leaves that area and goes to whom? He goes to Habib ibn Mubarak. He says to him, Oh Habib, do you know what the daughter of Ali is saying about us? That the daughter of Amir al Mu'mineen has doubt about our loyalty yes at that moment we are told habib ibn mudahir allahu akbar you see habib has a special uh, relationship when it comes to zainab and kubra what is his relationship when he arrived in karbala on the 6th of muharram people were jubilant people were happy yes when they were happy we are told someone told say the zainab someone has arrived Sayyidah said, who has arrived? He said, this is Habib ibn Mubahir al-Asadi. Yes. At that moment, she said, Ablaq Habib minni salam. Make Habib hear my salam. When they came to Habib, they said to him, oh Habib, the daughter of Amir al-Mu'mineen is sending her salam. Do you know what Habib did? The narrations tell us he sat on the floor, on the ground, he took the soil and started putting it on his head. He started slapping his face. He said, who am I for Zainab to greet him? Who am I for Zainab to send my salams to salams to me? Yes. And on that night, what happened? On that night, when he heard this, he came. He stood outside the tent with the other Ansar. He sent his salam towards Zainab and Kubra. He said, by God, tomorrow we will never abandon Aba Abdullah and Hussein. We will shed our blood and fight in order to uphold the principles and to bend the sacredness of the family of the Holy Prophet. That night, whilst in Ibad, in Sajda, and in the recitation of the Quran, there's a man who from Bani Tamim, he makes his way to the campsite. He came to see whom? Habib ibn Mubahar. This man, by the name of Ru'ayyim al-Tamimi, says, I want to speak to Habib. Habib comes and says, what do you want? He says, oh Habib, you are a man who is respected in your tribe. You are someone who is looked at with utmost honor. You are an old man. I am coming to you with advice. I don't want you to be killed tomorrow. You are an individual who should save yourself. In case you think Umar ibn Sa'ad is not serious, let me tell you the letter he received from Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. The letter today, alongside a number of soldiers that have joined us today, this man from the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad said, the letter says that if by tomorrow night, the Ashab and the family and Hussein are not slaughtered, then your head will be separated from your body. In other words, tomorrow is the day of killing and slaughter. Save yourself. Why are you in deep sleep and slumber? 
Habib ibn Mubahid is enraged with anger. He looks at him and says, War be to you. You tell me I am in deep slumber? Where is your religion? Where is your faith? Where is your conscience? You are the one who is in deep slumber and sleep. And then he says to him, Tell me, how would I face Fatima to Zahra on the day of judgment if I was to abandon her son Abba? <laughs> look at this man from Bani Tamim. You know what he would say to him? He would say to him, you know, if this was my family, do you think I would leave them? Do you think I would abandon them? That man would say, no. He says, these individuals are more worthy to me than my family. These people I will defend until the last breath of my life. Yes? Then he would say, by God, this is the famous statement of Habib ibn Mubarak. On the night of Ashura, he would say, by God, dying in the state with Hab is much better than humiliation with Baqi. Indeed, this is reminiscent of the famous statement of Aba Abdullah, Inni la ara al mawta illa sa'ada, wal hayata ma'abhali ina illa bama. And indeed, these individuals, such as Habib, demonstrated their true qualities, their loyalty, their sacrifice on the 10th. In which way? That we are told that on the morning, Imam alayhi salam gave a famous sermon when he said to them, Look around. Is there a grandson of the Prophet other than me? Did you not hear the Prophet say, Al Hassan wal Hussein, Sayyidai Shabab, Ahl al Jannah? Have I committed anything against you? Who was alongside him? Habib ibn Mubarak. The narrations tell us that Shimr al Lain responds to Imam and says, I think my belief in God is doubtful if I ever understand you. Habib said, I swear by God that you are right. Your belief in God has 70 layers of doubt because your heart is sealed and indeed very dark. He says to whom? He says to Shimmer. That's why Habib ibn Mubahar was anticipating the moment of martyrdom. He was waiting for that moment. The narrations tell us he had a special relationship with Muslim ibn Awsaja from Bani Asad that when Muslim went and fought valiantly, courageously, he went to the battlefield. When he was struck, Habib came and sat next to him. He said to him, O oh Muslim, if I knew that I will live longer than you, then certainly I would have asked you to leave a will. Muslim said, O oh Habib, there is a will that I want to leave. He said, what is it? At that moment, Muslim said, and looked at Aba Abdullah and says, Alayka bihada. Oh Habib, make sure that you do not stay alive and Hussein is not protected. Make sure that you attain martyrdom before Aba Abdullah. And do you know what Habib said to Muslim? He said, Af'al wa Rabbul Ka'bah. By God, by the Lord of the Kaaba, I will definitely do so. That's why we are told that at the time of Salah, Imam alayhi salam stood with his companions to perform the Salah. Before standing to perform Salatul Khawf, the narrations tell us that Hussein ibn Namir, this wretched individual in the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad, said, you want to pray? Your Salah will never be accepted. At that moment, Habib ibn Mubarak said, How dare you, O oh man who is worse than a donkey, you be think that your salah is accepted and the salah of the grandson of the Prophet isn't? And there were some skirmishes. At that moment, Habib recognized it was the time that he must sacrifice his life, that he must defend the principles of the true path of Islam. And he leaves the battlefield. He fights courageously. He killed 62 of the enemy combatants until he's surrounded and he is struck by the same man Hussein. He falls onto the ground and finally a man from Bani Tamim comes and beheads him. One of the first heads in Karbala to be beheaded was Habib ibn Mubarak. Imam alayhi salam comes and sits next to the body of Habib. He looks up to the heavens and says, Allah rewards me and the patience when I come and see these sights related to my companions. May Allah bless you, O oh Habib. You are the one who used to recite the Quran entirely in one night. 
we are told that the head of Habib ibn Mubahir was carried on a spear alongside the head of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, was taken to Kufa, yes? At that moment, his son, when he would see the head of his father, he came to his mother and said, oh, mother, there is a head that is being carried and paraded in Kufa. She said, tell me whose head it is. He said, this is the head of my father, Habib ibn Mubahir. The narrations tell us that she did not do anything unless she looked towards Medina and says, Assalamu alaykum ya Fatima al-Zahra. I can stand and say that my husband defended your son Hussein on the tenth. Indeed, the head of Habib was carried where? On a spear. I tell you, another head was carried on a spear, but this head was dropped on the ground, was stamped by when it comes to the hooves of the horses, was poked, and that was the head of Abu Abdullah. Yes, one particular man, a priest on the journey from Kufa towards Sham, the Sabaya, they would walk being chained, being tortured, being humiliated with the heads, including the head of Abu Abdullah on a spear. We are told the Christian priest in that village on the way, he notices at night that there is light coming out from a particular location. He comes and asks, what is going on? Who are you? They say, we are the army of Yazid. We have taken some captives. They were rebellious. He says, whose head is this? They say, this is the head of the son of Fatima. He says, Fatima, the daughter of the prophet? They say, yes. He says, how dare you? You have a son from your prophet, and you behead him in such a way. And he says, I have 10,000 dinars. I wish to give you this and allow me to take the head so that I can keep the head just for one night. They say, okay, fine, take the head. He takes the head of Imam Hussein. He takes it and he looks after it. He washes it. He fragrances it. He looks at it. And he says, I swear to you by God, speak to me. Tell me who you are. And Lama Majlisin Bihar says, when he said this, the head began to speak. The head began to say, and Ibn Muhammad al-Mustafa, and Ibn Ali al-Murtaba, and Ibn Fatima al-Zahra, and al-Maktoul bi Karbala, and al-Abshad bi Karbala, and al I am the one who is thirsty in Karbala. I am the one who is alone in Karbala. I am the one who is beheaded in Karbala. I tell you that the torment of the head continued until the majlis of Yazid, in which he would carry a stick and poke the same eyes, the same mouth, the same cheeks that Rasulullah would kiss. He would poke the head of Abu Abdullah. He would ridicule the head of Imam al Hussein. <laughs> وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين